I'm curious what you make of the fact of the House seats that you lost and, and why that happened. Well, it happened simply because uh, we were not able uh, to discipline ourselves uh, according to uh, voter sentiment. What that means is they couldn't control the black grassroots. They couldn't keep these young rabble rousers in line. I failed to keep the niggers corralled and keep these niggers on the plantation and keep them doing what they're supposed to do. I couldn't control the niggers. We, we failed to keep them in line this election cycle. That's what discipline ourselves means. It means we couldn't control them. That phrase, defund the police, cost Jamie Harrison tremendously. Now, I'm not saying it was the only problem. You sound kind of mad, Congressman. It sounds like you're blaming oh, yeah. the more progressive members of your party for holding folks accountable or to a standard that doesn't work in their district. Except that's a bald-faced lie. Defund the police is very popular in Minneapolis, in Atlanta, in D.C. Just ask the former Los Angeles D.A. Jackie Lacey how popular defund the police is. That's the entire reason why she's no longer going to be D.A. of Los Angeles. Defund the police is a winning issue. It's been demonstrated, battle-tested, battle-proven. Jamie Harrison lost because A, he was in an uphill battle. He's in a deep red district. The best that you could get from Jamie Harrison is he would be nothing more than a Democrat in name only. And secondly, yeah, he may have had a hundred million dollars behind him, but Jamie Harrison went out of his way to keep the black grassroots at arm's length. Not only did he refuse to say anything about defund the police, he refused to say anything about our tangibles, refused to say anything about reparations or anything else. He wanted to make himself as deracialized as possible. Possible. Jamie Harrison's message, such as it is, was crafted specifically to appeal to a white audience. He was trying to get some Biden Republicans, and what he found is there weren't any. He was trying to appeal to those right-of-center, read-casual, racist, white moderates. That's what he, who he was trying to appeal to. And what happened was they looked and said, well, if we got a choice between some black guy who's clearly putting on a performance, acting and talking like he's some sort of Republican. Well, why should we get diet Republican? We can go vote for Lindsey Graham and get the real thing. See, he pulled a political con game and it didn't work. It didn't fool anyone. And Jim Clyburn's he's hopping mad about it. He's blaming black people for it. He's not blaming Jamie Harrison for his asinine political strategy trying to appeal to a constituency that didn't want him in the first place. He's mad at black people for not showing up when the truth is Jamie Harrison didn't give black people a damn thing to show up for. And South Carolina, that's Jim Clyburn's home state. That's his very house. That's his house. As the white media puts it, the most influential black politician in America, second to Barack Obama. Oh, Jim Clyburn, he's the kingmaker, as the white media calls him. Well, if Jim the kingmaker Clyburn winds up being completely and thoroughly helpless to help Jamie Harrison in an election that he should have been able to win, well, that casts all sorts of doubt on what the hell does the white establishment need Jim Clyburn for? You see, he has to serve the interests of his white DNC masters. He knows that. White DNC masters that he answers to, they look at him and going, you know, damn it, Jim, we told you, we, we thought you could pull out the black vote. We thought you could get the black vote out. What went wrong with Jamie Harrison? He knows that makes him look bad because his entire job, his entire future hinges on whether or not he can control as many black people as possible. That's what the black misleadership class and the black bootlick stock and trade is. That's what they're all about. That's the entire reason that they're there. White power put them there for that reason and that reason alone. It doesn't want their input or opinions because they don't know anything. And white supremacy does not value these guys' thoughts such as they are. They are there simply to prove if they can control us. If they can control us and get us to dance to white supremacy's tune, get us to act against our interests, then they can get to stay on the payroll. But if they can't, their futures are in danger. Jim, Jim Clyburn's scared. Whenever you see somebody who is showing anger, you need to be asking, what is this person afraid of? Because fear and anger are flip sides of the same coin. In fact, anger is usually motivated by fear. Someone's scared of something. So what is it that's got Jim Clyburn so scared? What he's scared of is that he can see that his grip on black people's minds in South Carolina is slipping. 
And if he couldn't get black folks to turn out to vote for Jamie Harrison, he's looking and going, well, how long before they won't show up for me? And my my and my entire family and all of our hangers on future depends on me being able to consistently trick black people or cajole them or coerce them or scare them or what have you into showing up to vote. And if they don't do that anymore, then we're done. That's why he's hopping mad. He's scared. Do you blame the progressive members? No, I don't blame progressive members. I want everybody in my caucus to be as practical as I am. If you could have a caucus meeting right now and you would or, or tell folks what they should do differently, given the losses that we have, what would you say to them? Stop sloganeering. Sloganeering kills people. Sloganeering destroys movements. Stop sloganeering. Gee, nice to know slogans are what's killing black people. Good thing the police aren't the ones doing it. The only thing that sloganeering kills is political apathy. And the only thing that it kills is the ability of parasites like Jim Clyburn to be able to live off of Nancy Pelosi and the DNC as being their head Negro in charge. That's what he's scared of. Sloganeering, y'all gonna kill me. All this sloganeering, y'all y'all gonna have me out in the cold. These Democrats gonna throw me out. That's what he's really saying. Sloganeering is a threat to him. Black people have chosen of their own free will to be involved in an abusive relationship. You got these people who call themselves our misleaders claiming, as the white media would put it, that they work in our interest, but all they ever do is blame us for their failings. They're getting rich, they're powerful because of us. And when we demand what we should have, it's always the wrong thing. We're always wrong whenever we say, well, here's what we're supposed to have. Oh, you guys are wrong. Y'all y'all wrong. They'll yell at us and scream at us, in the case of Jim Clyburn, literally, more than any white liberal does. They go overboard to show, oh, you niggers aren't supposed to be asking for anything. These guys are talking to black people like a pimp talks to a whore. They yell at us. Tell us that demanding that the criminals who murder black people be punished is politically unpopular. Yeah, that black people should be allowed to live their lives in peace is unpopular. With who? Well, with the white power that lines their pockets. So we should just put up with the injustice. And a lot of us have chosen to do exactly that. What's the old saying? You teach people how to treat you? Well, we've been teaching people to take us for granted. Worse... We've taught them to treat us with contempt because apparently a lot of us seem to like it. The clowns who made excuses for voting for Joe Biden are now trying to put a pretty face on all this. They're looking real stupid about now. I mean, Biden didn't even wait until he got to the White House before he decided to stop taking their calls and stop returning their mail. He decided, hell, the second that they said we call it for Biden, that's it. I don't know you niggers anymore. Same as they did with Obama, they're still making excuses, though. Some of us never learn. Now, the stinking, reeking nexus of black misleadership in America, because there's many of them, but the biggest and ugliest and most smelly one of all has to be the Congressional Black Caucus. This group of self-interested con men and con women, they have been leading the charge to harm black people every chance they get. Seems there's no anti-black legislation that these guys won't champion. Like Jim Clyburn, for example. Do you know that he voted for the 1994 crime bill? That's, of course, the reason why he never criticizes the 94 crime bill. Why does Jim Clyburn attack the black community so much? Why does he attack the black grassroots so viciously? Look at the congressional delegation from South Carolina for a clue. There's seven House of Representative members and two senators from the state of South Carolina. But out of those nine congressional representatives, only two of them are Democrats. And to be honest, when you look at Jim Clyburn, where he gets his money from, the positions that he takes on the issues and the rhetoric that he spouts, you might as well put him in the Republican column too. And look at how angry this old sellout scumbag is. He's not mad at the police. You've never seen Jim Clyburn yelling and ranting like that at the thugs in blue. He never gets that mad at the Republicans and they're supposed to be the political opposition. 
At least that's what they would have you and I believe when the truth is the Democrats and Republicans are on the same team against us. He never gets that mad at the white women who voted for Trump. He doesn't say they're the reason why we lost seats. Instead, he's snapping and biting like a rabid dog at the very black grassroots who he needs to keep his undeserved seat in Congress. You know, when I see some forked-tongued, duplicitous scumbag who calls himself blaming the grassroots for the Democrats' failure, you know who that reminds me of? Roly-poly Martin. But this bastard Clyburn, he doesn't talk like a public servant at all. He talks like he thinks he's our public master. Now, as I mentioned before, it should come as absolutely no surprise that Jim Clyburn voted for the 1994 crime bill, a.k.a. Biden's law. And just like his buddy Biden, Clyburn has refused to apologize for his reprehensible anti-black act or to even acknowledge responsibility for the damage that he helped to do to the black community. This bastard is fighting his own personal war against black people. He hates black people as much as the worst Klansmen. That's the reason why, when it comes to black people, he's screaming and yelling, y'all the problem, y'all costing us elections, y'all gonna ruin it for me. Clyburn does not caucus with the Democrats. For a lot of his votes, anyway. And for some reason, that doesn't seem to bother either the white Democrat leadership or the Congressional Black Caucus. They don't seem to have a problem with all the times that Negro Jim Clyburn decides that he's going to go rogue and just vote with the Republicans. They don't seem to be bothered by that. They certainly didn't have a problem voting for him to be the House Whip, the Majority Whip, which is the third highest position for, for the majority party in Congress. So make no mistake, Jim Clyburn, when he does all this crap, voting for laws that harm black people, he is doing it with the full blessing and support of the entire Democratic establishment. And they're a congressional bootlick caucus flunkies. This after all the attacks he's made on the young people who the Democrats claim to be the representatives of. No one is rebuking Clyburn. No one's yelling at him to be quiet or telling him that his big dumb mouth will alienate the very voter base the Democrats need and cost them elections. Nobody says that to Jim Clyburn. Nobody says, hey, Clyburn needs to shut the hell up. We need all those young people that he's calling himself yelling at and running his big dumb ignorant mouth at. And that's because they're on his side. He's saying what they want him to be saying. He is voicing what the Democrats' agenda truly is. Hell, he's the point man for it. He openly attacks people demanding that the police be defunded. There are cities across the country and even entire states who are in favor of defunding the police. This is not a position that costs you elections. It's a position that wins you elections. Clyburn sounds crazy as hell opposing that, but he's the main one who's talking trash to the black grassroots, yelling and calling himself lecturing the very people who are demanding justice in the face of police violence. So why is Clyburn the main one doing this crap? It's because the white Democrat leadership needs a black face to tell these white lies. Oh, they can't have Biden or Kamala Harris or a Nancy Pelosi do it. Biden's a white man and the author of the 94 crime bill. Kamala is a lifelong prosecutor and liar. And Pelosi's a white woman who has been ethnically cleansing San Francisco of black people for the last 25 years. The con game would be only too obvious if any of those three chumps were the ones who tried to browbeat the grassroots into silence. John Lewis is dead, so Negro Jim Clyburn is the best they can do. They would have been better off doing nothing at all. But you notice how nobody, not even the white media, brings up, Hey, Mr. Clyburn, weren't you the one who voted for the 94 crime bill back in the day? They don't bring that up with them. They're not going to confront them on it. And the reason why is this is a policy the white supremacy wants to stand. You can't make it into a matter of the 94 crime bill is a bad thing. You can't be doing that. You can't be making it where people lose their congressional seats because that becomes an issue. Oh, it's okay if you bring it up with Biden once. But then you have a a phalanx of black bootlicks say, we don't mind, that don't matter. So no wonder we see this decrepit, treasonous old fossil out here singing Biden's praises and ready to fight you if you oppose police violence. 
Clyburn's congressional seat is safe, they think. And he's old as hell, so he won't be in office much longer anyway. So it's okay to let this geriatric piece of trash take the arrows for the white Democrat leadership. These old Negroes love being cannon fodder for white mommy and white daddy. You know, Herman Cain thought it was cute to go to reckless lengths to prove his loyalty to the white establishment. Oh, he went to a Donald Trump rally up jam-packed house. Everybody decided we don't need no stinking face masks. Oh, and he sits himself right in the middle of all them folks, while everybody's screaming and yelling and exhaling to beat the band. A gigantic petri dish is what that arena was. And a few weeks later, Herman Cain assumed room temperature after he caught COVID-19. Gee, who would have thought that a man who was a cancer survivor... And elderly, which happens to be two of the three worst risk factors for fatality from COVID-19. Who would have thought that a cancer survivor, and when you get chemo treatment, your white blood cell count drops to basically zero. I mean, going to a cold room could kill you. And the man's old as hell. And who would have thought that this would be enough to kill him? See, these old Negroes are suicidal. When it comes to getting that pat on the head, these old Negroes are willing to die for it. And they can't understand why we're not willing to die for that pat on the head from white massa too. That's what these old Negroes are. They'll yell at young black people for trying to protect black folks from police murders, but they won't whisper a syllable to their white political and financial benefactors. You have never seen any of these so-called black politicians pulling a Clyburn and yelling at white moderates, read casual racists, that they will cost the Democrats elections because they refuse to support police accountability. Why is it that they never say that? Because that is what the voters are actually saying. You win elections by saying we're going to take on the police. Don't believe it? Go ahead and ask the former DA of Los Angeles, Jackie Lacey. Ask her how opposing police punishment, how well that went over with the voters. Ask her how popular a position that was. Jim Clyburn and the white supremacists back of him, they know what the reality is, but the thing is they need to try to find a way to trick you into backing down. Long as you decide to dig in your heels, you got the bastards on the run. They can only win if they can get you to turn tail and walk away. Two-faced liars like Cori Bush, they got to office by telling black voters that she's all about police accountability. Ain't that what Cori Bush was saying? And no sooner than she gets elected, she immediately turns around and starts spouting the same old LGBT immigrant rights line. This is what lost the Democrats those House seats. See, black folks have made it clear what our demands are. And the Democrats have made it clear that they will, they'll gladly throw away every seat in Congress before they accede to our demands for justice. And so they're losing those seats. The Democrats playing this game of political chicken with us. This is their little game of political brinksmanship. We're not scared to lose every seat in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Good, because we're not scared to make sure you lose every one of those seats. We're not, we're not scared to take those seats from you. Because if you defy the will of the people and call yourself raising your voice at the very grassroots who you serve, then they'll decide it doesn't matter who wins that election. The Democrats won't make the people blame themselves for this. In fact, the people are looking and going, hey, this is your punishment for not doing what we say. Democrats are trying to tell us it's a bad thing that they lost House seats. This is the very outcome that we wanted. We are punishing them for not doing what we say. But they're trying to play this game of, uh, uh, it's scary. Them Republicans, they're going to take over. We losing seats. We losing the wall against the Republicans. Well, hell, looking at Jim Clyburn and the positions he takes and the rhetoric he spouts, he's one of them. This level of blatant contempt by the Jim Clyburns is intolerable and unforgivable. But let's understand, he became this belligerent because the people are making demands. That's the reason why he's out here, 
talking all bad. That's the reason why he's out here calling himself shooting off his mouth. The people are making demands. That's the game changer. You never see Republicans telling their constituents that they need to stop demanding illegal aliens be deported. Why? That's an unpopular position. Y'all need y'all need to stop it with that. There y'all going to lose us election. Stop it with the sloganeering. Slo- what do you mean drill baby drill? Don't you need no, 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 big coal is unpopular right now. You drill baby these things going to cause us election. They never say that. Nobody, the Republicans would never tell their constituents, you all need to stop it with the white power demonstration. Stop it with the Confederate flags. Y'all gonna lose us elections. They wouldn't dare do that. When Republicans lose elections, they have one response and one response only. The candidate wasn't right wing enough. The candidate wasn't conservative enough. The candidate was not die hard right wing enough. When Republicans lose elections, they don't blame their white base. They don't blame the Proud Boys and Adam Waffen. Have you noticed that? The Republicans, you haven't seen anyone saying, well, damn, if it wasn't for all of these lunatic white supremacists, you know, Charlottesville is what lost us the election. And all these Confederate flag waving crazies, they didn't do that. They did not blame any of the hate criminals and mass shootings that have taken place on Donald Trump's watch. They did not blame their white grassroots at all. Quite the opposite. When Republicans lose elections, they don't back down, they double down. But that alone, the political electoral dimension, that alone doesn't explain why Jim Clyburn does all this extra crap. Why it is that he goes above and beyond the call of coonery to spit in the faces of the very grassroots that he and the Democrats desperately need. He goes overboard to talk just like an old white conservative. He makes it a point to excoriate the grassroots publicly. He wants to make sure everybody sees this. He's putting on a show. And why is that? Because Clyburn understands that the white Democrats in South Carolina are a lot closer to Republican ideology, and so is he. So he happily uses words and phrases that will appeal to them. But it's more than Clyburn's right-wing rhetoric that's made it where he's held his seat. It's money, and lots of it. Oh, this guy, he wasn't the winner of his election. He was selected for that position. And even though he's only one of two Democrats at the federal level in the entire state to hold a congressional seat, corporations are only too eager to give him and his family members tons of money. When the white media keeps calling Jim Clyburn influential, money is what they're talking about. Jim Clyburn's real constituency isn't black people or the voters of his district. His true constituency are the white corporate interests who have made him rich. He's not in the business of public service. He's in the business of self-service. But it's not as if Clyburn's family members and relatives haven't been caked off. Clyburn's daughter, Mignon, is about to get a White House job. She'll be advising the Biden transition team as to what to do with the FCC so as to ensure a smooth transition for the Biden appointees who are going to get appointed to the FCC. What that means is Mignon Clyburn will tell Biden what people the media companies want on the FCC. It's no accident that practically all the people who get appointed to the FCC were in fact corporate officers who worked for one of the big media or communication companies. So Mignon Clyburn's going to act as AT&T and and T-Mobile and other communication companies mouthpiece for the Biden transition team. These companies will get people on the FCC who will do their bidding. And this isn't her first dealings with the FCC, by the way. Mignon Clyburn was appointed to the FCC during the Obama administration. And after she left the FCC, like most politicians and government officials, she began a consulting business. Now, this woman isn't qualified to consult a chicken on how to lay an egg. Only thing she's qualified to do is to carry out the wishes of whatever white corporation or wealthy individual is standing in front of her. What idiot would possibly want to seek any advice from her on anything? Well, it turns out quite a few. Not that they want her advice, actually. They just want to pay her money. 
It's no accident that most state and federal politicians or their immediate family members open up some sort of consulting business. And it's also no accident that these people immediately get all sorts of business from companies who they used to regulate or write the laws for. This is how the system of bribery works in the United States. In America, you don't give the bag full of cash to the politician directly, and certainly not while they're in office. What you do is you give the cash to the politician's family members, who in turn hand the money to the politician. Or you wait until the politician gets out of office, and you give them what amounts to a de facto corporate pension. Because that's what this truly is. That's how bribery works in the United States. You make everyone around the politician rich. You make all their family members and their circle of friends rich, and they're the ones who make sure that the money gets back to the politico in question. And, as far as the politicians who really have done the real yeoman's work for the corporations, when they leave office, that's when you start making sure they get all sorts of money for nothing. This is what happened with Mignon Clyburn. Because after she left the FCC, it wasn't long at all before the exact same media and communication companies that she had been regulating were tripping over their shoelaces to offer her some cushy, do-nothing corporate job where all she has to do is sit and collect a paycheck. Among the first to come and give her a job was T-Mobile, they said that they were going to pay her to advise them on the Sprint merger. Now, keep in mind, this was after she was out of the FCC and during a Republican administration. Now, what possible advice could a career Democrat flunky offer during a hardcore Republican administration? What possible useful advice was she going to give? What was it that T-Mobile couldn't pay any of the people on the FCC to tell them anything, really? Practically all the FCC commissioners get some sort of well-paid corporate job with some communications or media company after they leave the FCC. That's their reward for services rendered. Because T-Mobile wasn't the only white corporation that was greasing Mignon Clyburn's palm, the movie studio Lionsgate has put her on their board of directors. Remember, Lionsgate is also the same studio who put out so many of those vomitous Tyler Perry movies. And just last week, another communications company, Ring Central, appointed Mignon Clyburn to their board of directors. Man, there seems to be a small stampede of white corporations who are awfully anxious to put this irrelevant former bureaucrat on their payrolls. Almost as if they know well in advance that she would be getting a White House job soon. Sure, part of it is they're rewarding her for what she's already done, but they seem very eager, and they've been doing this for the last year and a half or so, handing her these do-nothing jobs. We want to put you on our board and all the rest. Yeah, it's as if they already looked and said, you know what, um, this woman's probably going to be a real use to us real soon in a direct capacity. None of this is any coincidence. This is why Naker Jim Clyburn was so desperate to get Biden into office. This is the reason why Jim Clyburn was so anxious to see Biden get to the White House. Because Biden and Clyburn had already worked out a deal. And unlike the unthinking clods who were out here making excuses for voting for Biden without him promising to do anything for us, Jim Clyburn got solid pledges in place before he began yelling and screaming and lying on, Cl on Biden's behalf. You see, Clyburn didn't demand mere representation from Biden. He demanded tangibles for himself and his daughter. He didn't say Kamala's going to be vice president and that's good enough and um, she being in the White House will give me a spirit of hope. He said to hell with hope. I want my daughter to have a doggone job and I want her to make sure that certain policies get influenced directly. And he also made sure that there will be a White House job for his chosen flunky Cedric Richmond. Oh, you see, with Clyburn, he wasn't going to just uh, hold back. Y'all need to hold back and wait till after the election for y'all make all these demands. No, Clyburn let Biden know what the deal was going to have to be before he would give his support. 
So when Clyburn was on Meet the Press and saying, uh, what did I want? I don't want Biden to do nothing for me. <laughs> I, I, he, I, he, I don't want him to do nothing for me. Yeah, like everything else that Clyburn, that scumbag said, that was just another lie. Clyburn wanted a lot from Joe Biden. Not just for himself, but for his daughters and his would-be protégés. That's why all these white companies are suddenly tripping over themselves to put Clyburn's daughter on their boards. These companies already knew that if Biden was elected, then Clyburn would be owed a political favor, and the favor would be to put his little girl in some sort of government post close to the president, and she would be their inside woman in the White House. It's no different than what W talked about when he was put on the boards of Arbusto Drilling and Spectrum 7 and other companies during the 1980s. And you see it here, too. So understand, there's no difference between either of the major parties, certainly not where black people are concerned. The white media flooded the internet and airwaves with all sorts of propaganda saying that there's a difference between the two major parties. But when you look at how Jim Clyburn snapped and yelled at black people about the mere threat of defunding the police, tell me how he sounded any different than any other white Republican you ever heard. Hell, Donald Trump had better decorum and more restraint than Jim Clyburn on that issue. Even Donald Trump knew better than to yell and scream about defunding the police. Even Donald Trump acted better than Jim Clyburn. So what does that tell you? You want to trigger Jim Clyburn, go ahead and threaten any of white supremacy's interests. And that brings us to Clyburn's would-be protege, Cedric Richmond, scumbag from Louisiana. Back in 2018, Cedric Richmond was the head of the Congressional Black Caucus. And in November of that year, he began demanding that if the Democrats won back the House of Representatives in the 2018 midterms, then, as the head of the CBC, he wanted one of his to be named Speaker of the House, or at the least, Majority Leader. Of course, as we all know, the Democrats got back the House in 2018, and Nancy Pelosi is Speaker and Steny Hoyer is Majority Leader, so they didn't get that. Clyburn, however, got his old job back as Majority Whip, and that's pretty much all he got. And I suppose that for the Congressional Bootlick Caucus, that's what qualifies as a win, right? Because you ain't heard them having a problem with it, so what does that tell you? They were just doing that as a way to magnify their own position, as a way of saying, hey, don't forget to give us a token spot. You, you got to kick us off. Just goes to show the Congressional Black Caucus is nothing more than a boule bootlick club, a sorority of sellouts and a fraternity of fakers, phonies, frauds and fools. They don't advocate for black people. They're just advocating for themselves. They tell black people not to make any demands, wait until after the election. That's what Cedric Richmond told Ice Cube, and that's what he was telling us by proxy. Meanwhile, Richmond, back in 2018, he was making his demands before the election. He didn't say, well, you know, we got to wait until Nancy Pelosi and them are back in charge before we can make any demands. He said, no, nah, before we have this um, 2018 midterm, uh, we need to get it straight now what the distribution of leadership is going to be. We need to get it straightened out now who's going to have what position. He didn't say, well... We can't be demanding anything. Yeah, I mean, the, why Nancy Pelosi's not even back in charge yet? We can't be making any demands yet. He said, hell no, we're going to get this straightened out before the election. See, Cedric Richmond didn't tell Nancy Pelosi that he would hold off until after the 2018 midterms. No, he made his demands up front before a single ballot had been cast. December 2018, Jim Clyburn formally named Cedric Richmond as his assistant whip. Now, for a few years, I've been pointing out how the white media's black bootlicks and their do-nothing organizations like the NAACP and the National Action League, how these clowns are constantly having luncheons. Seems that's all these bastards ever do is eat. Now, of course, we've been joking for a while now about the NAACP Spring Luncheon and the National Action Net Network Summer Luncheon and the Urban League's Fall Fish Fry. 
Well, this year, Democrats were literally giving out butter biscuits to get black people to vote. Now, what needs to be remembered is that these are not really jokes that we've been telling about these organizations. We're being dead serious because that's what these clowns are. What this is, is us pointing out the complete perverted farce of what passes for black politics in this country. This is what the black misleadership class does. This is a sign of blatant, naked contempt. Now, the reason that I bring up the food angle again is Jim Clyburn has an annual fish fry. I'm not making that up. This event, this is America. But at Congressman Jim Clyburn's fish fry, everyone is welcome. Started in 1992. I said to myself, I said, look, we're going to have a fish fry. And we're going to make it affordable for all these people that come here working. And they said, well, what's affordable? I said, it's free. And so that's what started the fish fry. South Carolina's Democratic Party holds its annual convention on the same weekend. But some of the most important politicking happens here. Donald Trump has got to go. Attendees who have come back over the years say it captures the essence of Clyburn's clout. Congressman Clyburn stands for everything that we stand for, integrity, doing the right thing, and helping people. It's very important where you create spaces where everyone feels welcome and everyone has the opportunity to speak to politicians, not just the wealthy. Clyburn is the highest ranking black member of Congress, and he's a kingmaker in this early primary state. For Democrats with White House ambitions, the fish fry has become a can't-miss event. He began giving out free fish once a year back in 1992. That was when he was first running for Congress. After all, the low information voters were talking about the black baby boomers, hood rats and dusty dudes. All of these simpletons who are silly enough to vote for a corrupt, slimy half wit like Clyburn well, giving them a, a couple of free pieces of fish that would appeal to their bare minimum mentality. I mean, this is some real step and fetch it Amos and Andy crap going on here. So once Clyburn found out that a fish fry was a good way to get black folks to show up in large numbers so that he could promote his own political interests, he began doing it every year. And the white media would cover it because they always have to credentialize the sellouts like Clyburn. This is meant to magnify his importance. Oh, he got all these folks to show up for some free food. That must be because he's important. So whenever you hear us talking about these civil rights retreads and these black baby boomer bootlicks, and we're talking about the Rainbow Coalition winter fish fry, just understand, we're not joking. We mean it literally. This bastard Clyburn, he's so damn ridiculous, the more you try to insult him, the more accurately you wind up describing him. But black folks, as a people, we will never be taken seriously as long as this is the level of politics we choose to engage in. This is step and fetch it level crap here. In D.W.F. Griffith's racist movie Birth of a Nation, he showed the black lawmakers eating chicken, their feet up on the table and such. This is a racist white caricature that Jim Clyburn has decided to turn into a reality. This is the playbook that he operates out of. This is the well that he draws from. When he, you're sitting here, we're going to have a fish fry. We're going to do a fish fry every year. That is telling black folks, no, y'all ain't really about no serious interest. Here you go. Here's some, here's some pieces of fish that I bet he bought from a white company. And y'all go ahead. All this paid for by the DNC and y'all make sure y'all vote. So while this bastard is voting for the 94 crime bill, I mean, as soon as Jim Clyburn got into Congress, he got elected to office in 93. So the second that he walks into the Capitol building, his very first act, I'm going to vote for that 94 crime bill. That was the first that was damn near the first thing that he did as soon as he got elected. So all them dumb Negroes eating that free fish. Yeah, he's also got another free meal that he's got lined up for you at the state penitentiary. 
Oh, black folks don't have any serious demands. We don't have any serious interests. Why, voting, that's just another get-together for us to sit around and we're going to sit here and we're going to, you got some clowns monkey shining and such. Oh, we, we don't get serious. Oh, it's all about shucking and jiving. Meanwhile, Jim Clyburn is hoping the Democrats craft the turbocharging of the prison industrial complex. You got Jim Clyburn, one of the architects of mass incarceration, or at the very least, to be most charitable to him, a major cheerleader for it, a supporter of it. And those black folks who were sitting there eating free fish, man, that turned out to be the most expensive free meal in human history. When you look at how many black folks have been punished and how many black folks and black communities have been devastated because of the 94 crime bill that Jim Clyburn voted for. This is not treating black people like children to have some fish fry. This is like treating black people like damn near animals. Oh, we're going to feed y'all some kibbles and bits. I would expect to see something like this in Birth of a Nation, except this is not a racist pro clan propaganda film. This is a so-called black man doing this. Clyburn has as much contempt for black people as David Duke. Well, my question is, when are black people going to finally have more respect for themselves than this? To allow a scheming, wrinkled up, treasonous worm like Jim Clyburn to be our representative in South Carolina, that guy should have been run out of town on a rail long time ago. And it's not as if these are any new facts, as if this is any new information that anybody didn't know. They've been talking about this for decades out in South Carolina. But the problem is when it comes to a lot of black folks, well, apparently there can, we can never take too much abuse to be able to overlook our own mistreatment. Apparently, we can never be too mistreated. We have no line that cannot be crossed. We have absolutely no red lines that we're willing to draw. There's no such thing as you've pushed us too damn far, for most of us anyway. It's like I've always told you. When it comes to any system of oppression, there is always a strong element of complicity. No system of oppression can endure for very long without the oppressed becoming willing collaborators in their own bondage. Now, I'm not putting all the blame on us, but the thing is, I'm not going to tolerate black folks sitting here acting helpless and pretending like ain't nothing we can do. Jim Clyburn is as much an invention of black apathy and black dysfunction as he is his white political masters. So what that means is if black people were at least in part responsible for the creation of this warped, twisted, perverted political monster, then we also have the ability to save ourselves from this monster too. We don't have to just tolerate this scumbag doing all this dirtbag behavior. We can pull rank on this clown if we choose to, if we make that our focus. But that said, make no mistake, Negro Jim Clyburn is acting under orders from the Democrat leadership. Not that he needs a whole lot of prompting on that score. This full-scale attack on the grassroots is coming from the DNC. This is what the Rahm Emanuels and the Nancy Pelosi's and the white big money interests they represent want. The grassroots agenda is what's popular. It's the only thing that will galvanize black voters. So, of course, these tools like Clyburn, they've got to lie and claim, well, what you guys want is going to lose us elections. Well, first of all, the right response to that is if you're not going to be putting policies in place, it's better to lose an election and get the policy that we want than it is to win an election and get nothing because it defeats the whole purpose of what we're doing. I'm not in the business of winning elections. I'm in the business of getting policy passed. And if there's got to be some people who fall on their sword every once in a while, so be it. It's about the freaking policy. It is not about any one person. Remember the military's definition of discipline? Discipline is putting the goals of the organization ahead of your own personal needs. Jim Clyburn, well, he needs a nice cushy government job so he can just sit around doing nothing and golfing full time. But as the black grassroots, our goals are power, wealth, and influence. Better that that bastard do what we say, pass the policy that we want, and lose the next election than for him to stay in there a hundred years and get absolutely nothing done. But that's how you think 
when you're all about the power, wealth, and influence, when you're serious about what you want. So when you say defund the police, Jim Clyburn gets scared as hell because he knows his white masters are hearing that and what they understand is disarm the police means to disarm the enforcement arm of white supremacy. The police are there to serve one function and that is to control you. They are there to make sure that you never oppose the unconstitutional laws that the Jim Clyburns pass to benefit their white corporate masters. The white elite are not there because they're smarter or work harder, that's for damn sure. They have their position because they happen to have a system that is rigged to give them that position, as Abraham Lincoln put it. He did not believe in the equality of the races, quote, I would see the superior position assigned to the white man. Well, if it's assigned, how do you stop the people who are being disadvantaged by this racial con game from rising up? Well, you're going to have to have a dedicated apparatus with a state monopoly on violence. That's what you're going to require. You cannot do it any other way. You're not going to form an argument that is going to hold the people in check. Now, granted, you can deceive them for a few minutes, but as soon as they decide that they're sick and tired of playing along, no amount of weasel words, no amount of duplicitous argument, no amount of shucking and jiving and aw shucks and fake phony insincere smiles is going to save you from the retribution of the public. So what you need is you need a dedicated apparatus who's got guns and has the state's okay to dispense violence with impunity. That's where the enforcement arm of white supremacy comes in. Now you see why it is that Democrats and Republicans alike have made it very clear this is a hill that they're prepared to die on. Nobody is going to infringe on the police being able to dispense violence against black people with impunity. You're not going to punish the police for that because if you do, you'll make them reluctant to do so. And if the police are reluctant to kill black people any time, anywhere, well, what happens when the courts decide that they're going to rule some asinine, unconstitutional ruling that flies in the face of the law and common sense? The people will look and say, you know what? We are not at all bound or required to follow laws that require us to be deprived, deprived of resources, deprived of our rights, of our human dignity. We're not, we are not bound to respect these laws. What's to stop the people from deciding that they're going to stand up for themselves and they're going to take their share of the world? They're not just going to sit there and every day they're going to see the fat of the land basically be the private preserve of a corrupt, filthy white elite, the Jeff Bezoses and the Mark Zuckerbergs and others. See these guys, these crooks, everyone from the Koch brothers to you name it. To see them living on the fat of the land and everybody just told, well, you know, there's a system in place and um, you got to play the game by these rules was to stop the people from saying game over was to stop them is a dedicated apparatus that dispenses violence. And that's the reason why they don't want you saying, you know what, the people are speaking and we're going to vote that apparatus out of existence. Now, what happens when Congress passes laws that advantage only the one percent? When they tell you, well, this land over here is already spoken for, or, well, you know, this land is off limits, or these resources, you can't have this. Now what you have is you have a chance for people to get what they want out of life because they don't have to play the game by the 1% rules. The job of the police is to coerce and intimidate the public into sitting on our hands and letting the 1% do whatever the hell they want. To force us to accede to living under a system of tyranny and deprivation orchestrated by a corrupt white elite. If the people make it clear that they're going to determine their own path and they will no longer sit idly by while rich white supremacists arbitrarily declare that they're going to take all the land and all the resources, then the police are there to beat or kill you if you decide you're going to disagree with that. If you look at these courts and say, wait a minute, these rulings, all these rulings do is enshrine the idea that I have no rights. Well, you know what? I'm going to stand up for myself. And more importantly than that, I'm going to make it very clear. There is no law that allows me to be brutalized or deprived of what I should have with impunity. You're not going to enshrine my place as a permanent underclass into law. I will not stand for that. Well, here's going to be coming the guys with guns. That's the function of the police. It is a social control 
apparatus. They're not in the business of public safety. They never have been. They're in the business of public control. The only safety they're concerned with happens to be the preservation of the power and privilege of the white elite. That's the only thing the police are truly trying to preserve. That's the only thing they're trying to keep safe. If the people all say that they're getting rid of the police, then there's nothing that the white elite can do about that. So they have to trick you into not doing that. They have to tell you, oh, there's going to be rampant crime in the streets. No, there won't be. People had safe societies long before such a thing as the police even existed. That being the case, it seems to me that the people can figure out the solutions on their own. And anyone coming along telling you you're going to lose elections, I'm more concerned about losing lives. Jim Clyburn ain't. He's concerned about losing elections, even though defunding the police is the position that wins elections. But nah, they, what he's really saying is we can't win elections and preserve white supremacy. We can't win elections and persist in our anti-black violence. We can't win elections and continue to promote all these anti-black policies. We can't win elections and be able to do business as usual. That's what he really means. Now, they could make the necessary changes and win elections, but they made up their minds. No, forget it. This system is all about grinding black people into the dirt. And so the Democrats are revealing themselves to be controlled opposition. And they're not even making any bones about who's doing the controlling. For centuries, the grassroots have suffered in silence. But the black media has shaken things up. And you see the response from the both major parties. They are both on the same page when it comes to making sure the police are never touched. When it comes to making sure that black people are denied our rightful due. Denied our tangibles for our ancestors and our own contemporary hard work. If the black grassroots refuse to suffer in silence, then they have to be made irrelevant. But this election proves that the Democrats cannot gain power without the black grassroots as much as they've tried. Their little failed experiment in putting together some new non-black voter base constituency hasn't worked. But black people have proven that we don't mind being slapped in the face by the white political establishment. So that's the reason why they feel so emboldened to send Jim Clyburn out there and why Joe Biden does not fear a black voter revolt. Because we've shown on too many occasions that all they got that we'll forget about their latest insult as soon as they pat us on the head. Though that little pattern seems to be getting a lot dicier recently. It's It's a much more risky proposition to try that lately. Now, the Democratic leadership is hell-bound to cater to the casual racist read white moderates. Problem is, they won't be catering to anyone if they lose all their seats before they can get white moderates to start voting for them. They're in a race against time. Because black people are walking away from this political con game faster than the Democrats can find white moderates to replace us. It would be one thing if they could find an adequate number of white moderates, if they could convince and persuade an adequate number of white moderates to break camp with the Republicans and go with the Democrats. But the thing about it is black people are leaving so fast, the Democrats are in a sinking ship and we're the ones drilling all the holes in it. That groundswell of Karens and soccer moms and low education white males that they were hoping would materialize never did. And black folks are making it very clear we are putting their backs to the wall. We are putting them in a do or die proposition. So right now is a very delicate and dangerous moment for at least the left hand of white supremacy's political machine. The Democrats serve the same corporate masters and interests as the Republicans. That is their only constituency, by the way, their corporate masters. The phony pro-populist rhetoric that the Democrats spout, it's only meant to get votes from you. That way they can take office and serve their true masters, their true constituency. The problem is their traditional base, black people, are opposed to these corporate interests. We're getting on code against them. And we've gotten organized to put a stop to this little game. They need to get the grassroots to stop making all these demands. 
This way, we won't scare off all the right-of-center voters who the Democrats truly want. Or worse, we won't force any changes on the system before they can put up a firewall, which is what these white moderates are supposed to be, a firewall to stop our political momentum. Clyburn whines that Jamie Harrison lost in South Carolina because all that defund the police sloganizing. All the sloganizing, he said. Problem with that lie is none of the Democrat candidates who lost their House seats this election ran on a platform of defunding the police. In fact, it wasn't even an issue in any of their elections. All the Democrats, those six Democrats who lost their seats, they all took the same line as Clyburn. It was Clyburn's position that cost them those seats. And why is that? It's because the streets are talking. And they're threatening the big money white corporate interests that Clyburn and the Democrats serve. So they've got to find a way to shame or browbeat the grassroots into silence. Now, let me tell you a little something about the 2020 election that the pundits haven't told you. The reason that these pundits and analysts have had such a hard time sorting out the voting results and making sense of it is because although there was massive voter turnout, This did not translate into one party or the other benefiting, as you would think. You see, it's all a big mishmash to them at a distance. Donald Trump lost. But the same voting districts that voted for Joe Biden did not vote for the Democrats at the House level. They didn't vote for the Democrats at the local level or the state level. And that's a problem that the white media doesn't want to have to admit to because they have figured out why this is. How can so many people have voted for Biden, but those exact same voters turn around and say, but I'm not going to vote for this Democrat in Congress. I'm not going to vote for this Democrat trying to get into um, this or that federal, even state office, because all the Republicans held on to the state legislatures. How could the Democrats, how could the voters say we're going to vote for a Democrat to be president and then turn down everybody else local and state? There's only one way you can get a lopsided idiosyncratic outcome like that. It's because Joe Biden didn't win this election. Voters didn't want Joe Biden either, just like they didn't want his Democrat friends at the state and county level. Biden did not win this election so much as Donald Trump lost it. Biden had one big advantage and only one advantage. A ham sandwich could have beaten Joe Biden this election. But the thing is, Joe Biden was running against a singularly polarizing opponent. Joe Biden's only advantage was he was running against Donald Trump, who voters, Democrat voters and a number of voters who were in the center who just don't like Donald Trump's tone. They were able to agree on one thing. They decided that maybe they didn't want some bellicose, ranting, angry Cheeto in the White House. And if they had to hold their nose and vote for the clearly senile idiot from Scranton, Pennsylvania, then maybe that's a bitter pill they'd have to swallow at least this time. But when it came to the rest of those Democrats, they were looking and going, nah, this is just, we're giving Biden a bye. We're going to give him a mulligan because of the fact that he's running against Trump. But the rest of you, y'all ain't running against Trump. Trump's wild man on campus shtick may have worn out its welcome with with just barely enough of the electorate at the national level. But when it came to those Democrats at the state and county level, now they were looking and going, now the Republicans you're running against, they're not as obnoxious as Trump. So we're going to let them stay. And some of you Democrats who can't get your minds right about some of these issues, you're going. The Democrats don't do anything for black people, but they get our vote anyway. Why? Because the game the Democrats always play is we don't have to do anything for you. Look at those Republicans. They're so, look at what those Republicans said. Look what those Republicans, they're so racist. You got to vote for us because those Republicans are so racist. And when we ask, hey, uh, you're going to do X, Y, Z for us, right? The Democrats say, well, that's divisive. Or like Bernie Sanders, it's not feasible. Or like Kamala Harris, you think I'm going to do something that only benefits black people? No. That's what they do when we tell them, hey, the Republicans are racist and all the rest of it. But this is not about the tone of whoever's in the White House. This is about our tangibles. We're here to talk turkey. We're not here to talk about niceties and courtesy. 
Because you've had Democrats who have been courteous as you like, at least until they went office and they're slapping you in the face, but they don't do a damn thing for you. This is about more than just tone, but that's the game that they've been playing. Oh, the Republican gets out there and he's, and they do it deliberately. Both parties play off of each other. They know exactly what the game is. Both parties help each other out. One party positions itself as the white man's party. The other party, allegedly, is supposed to be the party for everyone else. The disenfranchised and the downtrodden. This is how you dial people in for oppression for the long haul. You have to get them to buy into the idea that the system is somehow going to address the very problems that the system itself caused. So the system presents you with two false choices. You can either have some bellicose white supremacists, or you can have some on-again, off-again, courteous white supremacists. And this is supposed to be what qualifies as a choice. This is supposed to be what passes for an electoral choice. When the truth is, both parties understand exactly the game that they're playing. The Republicans get out there and they do all of the race baiting and all of the veiled and oftentimes unveiled racism, and that's deliberate. They're trying to clearly position, we are the white man's party. And that will scare black people and the Democrats come along and say, you saw what those Republicans just said? Why? They'll be hanging you niggers from trees this time tomorrow morning unless you vote for us. Well, you guys are going to do stuff for black people, right? We're not doing a damn thing for you niggers. This is just a matter of, you don't want those mean Republicans saying all that stuff. Why? They could inspire violence against black people. Meanwhile, Barack Obama sat on his hands while violence was being carried out against black people. But that's the game both parties are playing. They make it where they got you so scared of having a Republican in there that you'll sit on your hands and never notice that the Democrats ain't doing a damn thing about the situation. This is what we told you back in 2015. Ooh, Donald Trump, he dangerous. Ooh, he too dangerous to be in the White House. Let me tell you something. Anybody who refuses to deal me my tangibles, anyone who refuses to punish those who attack me, that's somebody who's too damn dangerous to be in the White House. Barack Obama was too dangerous to be in the White House. Biden's too dangerous to be in the White House. Trump's too dangerous to be in the White House. I'm trying to get you to understand these are distinctions without a difference. You're playing a stupid game with yourself when you try to pretend as if any of these guys are somehow different. They're not. They understand that you don't. And it is a suicidal delusion when you decide to call yourself thinking you got friends when you really don't. Next thing you know, you got some ranting, wrinkled up scumbag like Jim Clyburn telling you, you demanded that the police be punished for killing black folks, you gonna lose us elections. The way the democracy is supposed to work is constituents make demands and the politicians carry out those demands. That's democracy. But of course, we don't live under democracy. We live under white supremacy, which is the very opposite of democracy, the very opposite of justice. So when black people make demands, the politicians attack us and tell us it's not popular, even when it clearly is. Jackie Lacey's a black woman. And she lost her dog on seat because she refused to punish the police. And that's what Jim Clyburn's scared of. They don't want that to become habit forming. I told you over a decade ago in We're All Detroiters Now that the civil rights movement tricked us into using the wrong vocabulary. They tricked us into using the wrong words. And that matters because words represent ideas. You follow the wrong words, you will inevitably be following the wrong ideas, too. The job of the Jim Clyburns and the Simone Mammy Sanders and the Kareen Stud Pierres is to get you to go back to using the wrong language again. In the 1960s, they tricked us into chasing integration. They told us the most important thing was getting black faces in high places. Okay, and when we voted for these black faces, what black faces did we get? We got shameless traitors like John Lewis and Jim Clyburn. That's what we got. Well, today, these white liberals, they've begun chanting a new word and getting their black flunkies to disseminate the talking point. And this new word that they're using that has the same meaning as integration is representation. It's meant to push the exact same button representation. What that means is, please let us have some of our black folks in your white machine, your white media machine, your white political machine, please. This is all about begging somebody else for a spot at their table. 
integration, representation. It's all the same thing. It's not about you calling the shots. It's all about you begging to be part of somebody else's scheme. And what that means is you're always going to be at the bottom because you volunteered to be. Well, while a lot of the low information voters in our community who habitually make excuses for doing the same old stupid stuff, the same idiots who didn't learn for the last 30 years of Negro Jim Clyburn being the Stephen of South Carolina, those same fools, they're going to be learning a bitter lesson with Biden and Kamala Harris. Hell, a lot of them are already learning it now. They're realizing that Joe Biden's wasting no time showing him his pail behind. He's wasted no time at all. He ain't even in the White House yet. Hell, he hasn't even been formally, the states have not even formally confirmed or verified his electoral victory. And already he's making it clear, man, hell with y'all niggers. I ain't thinking about y'all. Y'all are already past tense. Let's go ahead and legalize and give amnesty to all these Latinos so we can go ahead and make sure that they replace you guys and bring in a voter constituency that's going to be more faithful to white supremacy's interests because you guys are clearly starting to wake up. That black media is getting y'all on code and you guys, you guys are broken bad on us. So we, better, we better go ahead and stitch together a new constituency, one that will actually be more devoted to white supremacy's interests. The reason that I focus on Jim Clyburn is because he is not extraordinary at all when it comes to the black misleadership class. I also want you to understand it is not some sort of victimless crime. It is not harmless when you make excuses for voting against your interests. That is not harmless to do. Those black people in South Carolina who thought it was cute to vote for Jim Clyburn, as soon as he got to Congress, his very first action was to vote for the 94 crime bill. I wonder how many of those idiots who were stuffing their faces with that free fish also wound up putting on prison orange. I wonder how many of them did. Well, considering that this idiot's managed to get himself reelected a number of times, it seems that not enough black people are concerned about that. Well, that needs to change. The Congressional Black Caucus is an invention of white supremacy. They are nothing more than a union, a political union for all of the boule and links and the other would be black elites who themselves pride themselves on being, well, if they can't be white, then they are white affiliated. We can't be white Democrats, but at least we can't be white supremacists, but we're at least white supremacist affiliated. That's how they see themselves. They are above black people. How do you know? Look at how Jim Clyburn talks to his very black constituents. They're making it very clear. This is a top priority for us. Well, y'all, y'all causing trouble. You know, back in the 60s, we got things done. What the hell did you get done in the damn 60s? I ain't seen a single Klansman go to prison. I ain't seen a single cop th who attacked John Lewis go to prison. What the hell did you get done? Voting Rights Act. Yeah, now you got the right to vote for John Lewis and Jim Clyburn. This is what you call progress? See, they always brag about stuff that benefits them. We got a lot of stuff done by we. What he means is the boule and the bootlicks. They got a lot done. They benefited a lot. And they're trying to brainwash you into thinking that, well, black folks, y'all used to living vicariously. Y'all used to having nothing. And the only the only images of black prosperity you see are on TV. And well, like, y'all can live vicariously through me and my good for nothing daughter. And uh, while we're busy getting caked off by these white companies, you guys will be cooling y'all heels for 25 to life because I voted for the 94 crime bill. And if y'all got a problem, with the police gunning you down the streets. Will you just shut the hell up? Y'all y'all slogan here ain't going to help nothing. Ain't going to change nothing. I ain't going to change nothing either because I'll be damned if I'm going to vote for some Black Lives Matters bill or if I'm going to vote to punish the police. I ain't going to vote for that, but I will vote for more laws to embolden the police like H.R. 115, the thin blue line law. I vote for that, but y'all, uh, y'all, because yeah, that ain't divisive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm propping up the police at a time when people are in the streets protesting the police. But you know what? I can, as far as I'm concerned, there are more important things than political popularity. It's all about serving that white supremacy. That's how Jim Clyburn thinks. And he's been allowed to get away with this because black people have coddled him and pampered him. And he has not been politically punished. He has been not been made to pay any sort of price for his treason and his treachery. And that falls on black people. We already know white supremacy is propping them up, but they wouldn't be able to hold them up if black people decided it's time to go ahead and run that scumbag out of Congress. It's time to make Jim Clyburn and his family's name mud.
When you look at the Congressional Black Caucus, you are looking at one of the official organizations of white supremacy. You are not looking at a friendly group. You're looking at part of the opposition. You're looking at part of the enemy here. They are damn sure not our friends. Jim Clyburn is simply no, he is no different than Sheila Jackson Lee, no different than Cedric Richmond. He's no different than any of those clowns. And I want you to start taking the hard line against these guys. Make it very clear that black people are putting an end to the congressional black con job.